Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Hairbrain Games, the week in games. I hope you had a good time. Spring is upon us, and we're seeing lots of rain and lots of people wanting it to actually act like spring up here in the Pacific Northwest. We think we'll get that next week. I guess time will tell, but we don't have snow like some of the other parts of the country. So with that, let's get rolling on to the news. Okay, not a bunch this week. Actually, it's been pretty mellow. I haven't seen a whole lot that's wowed me to tears, per se. But there is one phenomenon that I've seen coming around, and that is the Four Against Darkness solo gaming experience. I've seen it just kind of explode, looking on Amazon sales and looking at the various avenues. This is, I showed you last week, it is a book where you take a graph paper, pen and pencil, and this book leads you through creating your own dungeons and playing through your own your own uh, adventures, and for some reason I believe the simplicity of it, which I've sort of found as I've started my own, I haven't finished it yet, um, the simplicity of the game and just kind of the uniqueness I think has just led to word of mouth exploding this because it's been around for a while but somehow it's created a big phenomenon so if you haven't checked it out you might go on Amazon and check Four Against Darkness as sort of the starter book there's several books in a series but it's very interesting like and some people have come up with some ornate graph paper dungeons that they have created like so if you're an artist this is probably way up your alley uh, because you don't want to see my stick art dungeons let's put it that way uh, also GMT has announced uh, a couple weeks ago Time of Crisis um, expansion. Time of Crisis was sort of a odd juxtaposition of deck building and area control management in, in, a, in the uh, Roman in the setting of the Roman era when they were fight, contending over who was going to be in charge of Rome. Uh, very clever and they've come up with an expansion and part of that is they've also come up with rules for solo play for us solo gamers. Now they're a little bit coarse right now but I'm expecting them to be beefed up and uh, I, I went ahead and backed the expansion looking forward to it as well. Finally on a personal level I do have some reviews in the hopper. I I um, took some advice last week, and I will be doing a Black Orchestra review. I'm getting working on that now. Matter of fact, the board is all set up right below me. You just can't see it. Uh, but I do want to get that out there and kind of like spread the word on games like this. And with that, let's get to my question of the week. Thanks again for the questions, and we're going to continue on with the question series that seems to have come up when, does art matter to me in games? Which is very interesting. Last week it was, who was your favorite artist? Now it's like, how important, I guess, is art? And this is great because it's a topic tons of people can have and tons of people can have identical or anti-identical opinions on. We'll put it that way. The answer is, uh, absolutely, now. Art matters to me greatly, now. Uh, in matter of fact, it's probably the second most important thing to me now. First being core gameplay, being rock solid for whatever game it is I'm buying. I wouldn't say that a few years ago. Probably ten years ago I would have said, yeah, art's important, but it's really the game that drives the thing. And that was true back then, although I find as time has gone on that I've been far less interested in abstract games. Um, as much as I used to be, of course, you know, chess, checkers, blockus etc. They all have a place and I've enjoyed them, but as time has gone by I've found that I'm much more interested in investing in games as games have grown to invest in themselves from an artwork and a gameplay perspective. Uh, it's very important to me that the art is solid. It doesn't have to be great, it just has to be there and it has to be there as a catalyst to the game I'm playing to give me the narrative I'm constantly seeking in games, which is interesting because it does leave some games out of the running as far as my interest level. Uh, I will play chess, but it's not my big thing. Probably the exception to that is I don't need great art to play cribbage, which is probably my longest running and most favorite just fun mind, mindless card game that I enjoy and I find endearing and Gosh, I need to play that again. But maybe I do need an art version of Cribbage. How can we make that happen? Anyway, maybe you guys have thoughts too on what, what, what the power of art does now, or has it changed? Has your opinion changed? Does it not? Because there are people that just really love abstract games and can just really dive in. I think part of it's as a tinkerer, a game tinkerer, someone who just dabbles in a bunch of games rather than focusing on a few and really nailing them down, that might also have an impact on what draws me to the various um, games that I end up dabbleizing. Um, and with that, uh, let's get to my three games of the week. Alright, here's an oldie but goodie. Bang the Dice Game. 
I love this game, and matter of fact, it's pretty much retired Bang the Card Game, the original, not because it's better, but because I can teach this and get it to the table almost any time with almost any audience. Love it. It distills all of the great things about Bang the Card Game down into something that I can play really quick, especially because it has player elimination. Now, I don't have the expansion yet, which has sort of a ghost mode if you get it, if you get eliminated early, uh, but it is by far still one of those games I can just throw it on the table and get just about anybody to play. I love Western themes, and nobody's ever around to play Doomtown, which is not an easy game to learn, and so this is one I always recommend. Definitely, it's as far as fillers, it's probably an 8. Game-wise, it's a 7, but as as for someone you want to bring out through to the table, it's pretty much indispensable. Second, I haven't got on board yet with this, but stuffed tables, stuffed tables, talk about cute, talk about charming, talk about I want to play this, but I don't want to play this alone, I don't think. I'm going to be setting this up and checking it out, but I don't know how much, I just, it's so doggone cute. It's just so doggone cute. Just cute. And finally, sleeper surprise, I went into... Uh, the board game score last week and now I'm not really an impulse buyer I can't remember the last time I bought more than one game in a week uh, from impulse buying usually I limit it to at least only one game on impulse a week so I'm definitely not an impulse buyer this one though I looked at it and I'm like okay this is weird okay Check the reviews on it, 8.2, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm like, well, I'll give it a shot. I knew nothing about this game when I walked in other than a few vague comments made earlier uh, from people elsewhere. And then, but it does have some things I like, dice rolling, it has play, you know, different powers for each player, and it has almost a, like an arena challenge. And so I bought this Dice Throne and decided, what the heck? And you know what? It is a real winner for me. It came out of nowhere, and it's a real winner for me. It looks like sort of a, and I don't know the company that did it very well or whatever, but basically the premise of the game is you are a, a barbarian or you're a, uh, you know, the different, different like a paladin or whatever, and you have different dice for each character and a separate deck of cards for each character and separate sort of tokens for each character. So every character is very unique. Imagine um, Battle of Endings, War of Endings, you know how each character, if you played that, is very unique and very custom to that character and their rules and strategies are very are very specific to that. Well, this is the same way and it's really fast. Imagine Yahtzee, imagine King of Tokyo meets War of Endings. And that's what you get in this. And some people, the, the counter argument has been that it's been like, uh, you know, that it's kind of simple and unpredictable, but I haven't found it. So I found it to be actually pretty fun. I actually like how they, how they did this. It's very streamlined. You got cards that really, you can play that at certain times to help beef you up. You roll the dice, you're at the mercy of the dice, the combos you make, the Yahtzee kind of combos you make give you different powers and special abilities. You have a counter attack whenever you're attacked to try to f mitigate whatever, but and, you know, and this is one classic where the artwork is awesome in spots, and then in other spots it's a little, you know, it's pretty s standard. There isn't any real card work on the, or artwork on the cards, but what the heck? What a surprise. I love when I go in and one of my sleepers is a surprise. Oftentimes I go in and go, hey, it's okay, but this one's like, nope, this one's going to the table. So if anyone wants like a 15 to 20 minute battle, uh, like a King of Tokyo with even more specialized characters and your own dice to roll instead of the pool, uh, definitely check it out. Check out Dice Throne. And with that, let's get to my Tantrum of the Week. Get off my land. Okay. Kickstarter is a crapshoot. Let's get that out of the way. I know that when I back something, I release that money to the wind. Like... I, I, I take my risk, I take my chances best as I can and go, okay, this company, you know, I look at reputations, I do my work. So I don't usually back stuff that I'm like, this is a little too volatile for me. But even then, stuff falls through the cracks. So I've been very blessed that most for most of my Kickstarters, I think all but like one uh, actually like delivered eventually. I mean, they're always late. Every one of them's late. Um, with no exception. But I was actually disappointed this week to learn that one of the games I kickstarted, uh, A Dog's Life by Baton Games, had uh, not only not been communicating with us, they'd also not been paying their bills to people that have gone that went uh, on faith to help make them videos for the game and all that. Dog's Life is sort of a simple family game by designer Christian Bollinger. 
uh, that looked clever. It looked pretty cool. It wasn't a ton of money and stuff. And I backed and it was scheduled to be out by Christmas. And of course, it's clearly not Christmas of last year um, and stuff. And it always pains me when I see that, you know, communication woes and issues arise. It really separates the gold from the cruft of, of folks when, when it comes to Kickstarter, but it always pains me. And I, I, you know, any advice I would give to Kickstarter people doing it is look for examples of people who did it right and please follow their lead. Uh, because once once word gets out that you're not paying people for videos and they get a little vocal uh, and and when your your backers are like you're lying to us and all that there's really no way to recover without a complete 180 and I would love to hear from some folks who thought who've seen a Kickstarter go down the wayside where they just the the, the group that's that wants your money just kind of checks out and then comes back and makes it a success I would love to hear about that because for the most part I found that those who start success with, with good success techniques for communication I uh, generally stay that way and even though stuff happens and ships don't always make it from China here and whatever they stay true there's other ones that are just kind of like like straggling to, to, to even get the most basic of, of of milestones met just don't ever usually hit that jump so but I would recommend that, that once you once once you get that reputation it's a hard thing to get back so one example that I would say for any Kickstarter out there anybody even in entertaining is look for a game called unfair on Kickstarter unfair is the best the most absolutely professional handling of a Kickstarter project I've ever been on and I've or been on ever invested in and there have been a lot and a lot of good ones a lot of really good people a lot of really good well-run Kickstarters but nothing met the level of professionality as far as communication um, projection of what the game is delivery they were maybe a month and a half late which is really good considering the rest of them follow-up uh, they had certain cards that were that were not cut right. They they chopped into their their finances and fixed that. And they've continued to support it a year or so even after I got my copy. They're still supporting it. So look for the leaders. Look for the success stories and follow those Kickstarter folks. Or for any anybody who's planning on it, just remember how important that is. And that's my much much longer tantrum than I really ought to have had. But anyway, hey, I wish, I hope that they can recover. I hope that I get my copy of A Dog's Life. I love dogs. Um, but we'll see. Kickstarter is a crapshoot. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for joining me on Hairbrain Games, and we will see you next time on Hairbrain Games as well. Take care.